This chapter is for the movie lovers, the film lovers. And why do I say that? Because this chapter is all about filmmaking, the story behind the scenes. So, welcome to Poets and Pancakes by Asoka Mitran. Let's know a little about the author before we move about for the story. Asoka Mitran, a Tamil writer, recounts his years at Germany Studios in his book, My Years with Boss, which talks of the influence of movies on every aspect of life in India. It was one of the most influential film producing organizations of India in the early days of Indian filmmaking. The duty of Asoka Mitran in Germany Studios was to cut out newspaper clippings on a wide variety of subjects and store them in files. Although he performed an insignificant function, he was the most well-informed of all the members of the Gemini family. Well, we are all aware of the Gemini Studios and this is a story based out there, initially when it was set up. Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that Gemini Studios bought in truckloads. Now, obviously, if it's a studio, it's all about makeup. It's all about creating new faces. And what does that? The makeup. So, they used to call for it in truckloads. Truckloads means they used to call for it in a huge amount. Trucks used to be full of the makeup. Greta Garbo must have used it, Miss Gohar must have used it, Vejanti Mala must have also used it, but Rati Agnihotri may not have even heard of it. Now, if we are talking about this famous actress, Greta Garbo, she was voted as the best silent actress. Her name was there in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most beautiful woman. Vejanti Mala, Devdas, we know it's a very uh, old film but a very famous one and Rati Agnihotri was one of the old actresses. So in those days when it was really very old years back, these people had heard of this pancake that was the brand of the makeup but when uh, later the actresses went on coming uh, down the years, then that company was gone. So it was no longer there. So that's the reason they say Rati Agnihotri may not have even heard of it. The makeup department of the Germany Studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been Robert Clive's stables. Now, here what they are saying, where was this makeup studio? Right, where was it? It was in a building of Robert Clive's stables. He was the first British governor of the Bengal presidency. He was the one who had, who had laid the foundation of the British power in India. So we are talking about his buildings. So the Germany studio had the makeup room there. A dozen other buildings in the city are said to have been his residence. Now obviously, you know, when he had laid the foundation, he was at the presidency level. So he must have captured quite a few of them. For his brief life and an even briefer stay in Madras, Robert Clive seems to have done a lot of moving besides fighting some impossible battles in remote corners of India and marrying a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. Now they are telling you all about him. Here he says he, had, he, used, he stayed for a little while in Madras and he seems to have done a lot of moving. He kept moving from one place to another. He was not fixed at one place. Besides fighting some impossible battles, he also fought a lot of impossible battles in remote corners of India. He was not in the main places, he went in the remote corners, right in the old areas of India and he married a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. The makeup room had the look of a hair cutting salon with lights at all angles around half a dozen large mirrors. Now, I'm sure we all are aware how makeup rooms look, right? They have a lot of light, they have a, lo a lot many mirrors and that's how you see, uh, you know, the makeup being done. So you have them, you know, uh, at every angle you have those mirrors, 
you you want to see see when an actress dresses up obviously you know she wants to see around be it anybody for that matter be it an actor also he wants to see himself all round how do i look right so they have to have mirrors at every angle they were all incandescent lights so you can imagine the fiery misery of those subjected to makeup now these incandescent lights are you know when they heat up they heat up and they emit light so you can imagine the light along with the heat coming out from these lights and the fiery misery of those those who had to do the makeup there now they had to face all of it they had to face that those you know those intense lights with a lot of heat coming up the makeup being done you know something it's very easy to look really gorgeous really stunning on the screen but what they have to go through behind the scenes is a big big torture and so obviously so those who had to get the makeup done had to go through all this torture the makeup department was first headed by a bengali who became too big for a studio and left initially there was a bengali who was leading that studio but yeah then he became a little too famous and so he left from there he was succeeded by he was followed by a maharashtrian who was assisted by a dharwar kanadiga and andhra a madras indian christian now this is one of the uh, one of the cast of the indian christians and anglo burmese and the usual local tamils now anglo burmese are you know these are the eurasians of burmese with a european descent so these are those it's a combination basically and uh, the usual local tamils now this uh, after the uh, after the bengali all these people came in line now all this shows now let me tell you uh, let me bring this to your notice rather so you have an andhra you had a person from andhra you had this christian you had an anglo burmese you had a tamil what does that bring to your notice what does it bring come on think of it quickly till i tell you yes all this shows that there was a great deal of national integration long before all india radio and doordarshan began broadcasting programs on national integration now this is you know just post independence this period that we are talking about was just uh, post independence uh, i mean it was around those years only so before doordarshan and all india radio could start you know uh, broadcasting programs on national integration somewhere the seeds had already been sown where you saw people of all different castes coming together working for one this gang of nationally integrated makeup men could turn any decent looking person into a hideous crimson hued monster with the help of truck loads of pancake and a number of other locally made potions and lotions wow you can imagine generally what we feel makeup is for wow like brightening up and you know looking gorgeous but this these people this whole gang of you know the people who did the makeup the makeup artists they could turn any decent looking person into a hideous hideous ugly scary they would literally turn a nice a decent looking person into a scary crimson hued monster crimson is red he was totally crimson hued was like totally studded with a red thing a monster with the help of what obviously the truck loads of makeup that would come of the pancake and along with that they would use a lot of potions like there's some liquid made up you know where you sort of a foundation types many liquids then so potions and lotions those were the days of mainly indoor shooting and only 5% of the film was shot outdoors now in those days it was not the trend like today today it's most of the time outdoors but then it was only 5% outdoors and the remaining was totally done indoors there was nothing there was hardly anything going out i suppose the sets and the studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made to look ugly in order to look presentable in the movie well what a contrast they needed to look ugly to look presentable so 
ugly in the sense so even if they were nice looking people you know smart and beautiful people or handsome people but the makeup would make them look ugly which would look presentable in the movie funny isn't it a strict hierarchy was maintained in the makeup department now in those days there was an hierarchy there was a flow of you know the power sort of thing they had an hierarchy uh, even in the makeup department the chief makeup man made the chief actors and actresses ugly i mean how do they put it up they literally are saying that he used to make them ugly with the makeup irony his senior assistant the second hero and heroine the junior assistant the main comedian and so forth so now you see the hierarchy so the chief one would take care of the chief actor and actresses uh then his senior assistant would take care of the second hero and heroines and the junior assistant would uh you know take care of the main comedian and so forth so this is how they had an hierarchy in the makeup department the players who played the crowd were the responsibility of the office boy now the makeup department also had an office boy even the makeup department of the germany studio had an office boy so all the people you know who used to uh, fill up the fillers like all the crowd the people walking here and there showing in the movies now they were taken care of their makeup was taken care of by the office boy on the days when there was a crowd shooting crowd shooting means many many people coming together uh, for the shoot maybe it was a scene of a road you know people are coming going or some uh, theater or something where so many people are seated where you required many number of people in the background you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel and slapping it on the crowd players now what would he do this office boy he would literally make that paint sort of a paint thing in a giant vessel in a very big vessel he would make one common color and what he would do it he would slap it on the crowd players slap in the sense you know they would color the face so it's like as good as slapping he would do that with a paint brush i'm sure the idea was to close every pore on the surface of the face in the process of applying makeup now all the pores around the face they were coated they were thickly coated with this so called paint you can imagine the makeup then i mean the quality the style uh, things were not developed then so obviously uh, things have changed drastically then and now he wasn't exactly a boy he was in his early 40s having entered the studios years ago in the hope of becoming a star actor or a top screenwriter director or lyrics writer now this so called office boy he did not come there to become an office boy he came there as a struggler he wanted to you know set his foot on the in the film industry but so he came with the dream of either becoming an actor or a top screen writer or a director or a lyrics writer he wanted to become any one of those he was a bit of a poet too apart from having the qualities of doing all these of taking up any of these posts he used to also write poetry in those days i worked the author is talking about this i worked in a cubicle to whole sides of which were french windows now cubicle is a basically a partition in a room it's one place you know in a room where it is partitioned with probably uh, glass and french windows now i didn't know at that time they were called french windows you can see the french windows you know they have fully open like right from top to bottom seeing me sitting at my desk tearing up newspapers day in and day out most people thought i was doing next to nothing now what was this author doing actually there he was sitting in that cubicle in one corner of the room it was in, like i said in that partition in the room itself and obviously it had glass windows so anyone could see him through what he was doing inside and all that he used to do was tearing papers maybe cutting it from newspapers 
day in and day out all the time day in and day out all the time and most people thought he was doing nothing he was what what is he doing he's only tearing papers that's his job i mean obviously they felt that that's good for nothing that's how they felt it is likely that the boss thought likewise too he says everybody thought the same now my boss who had appointed me also felt the same he appointed me to do that work and then he feels that i'm doing nothing so anyone who felt i should be given some occupation would barge into my cubicle and deliver an extended lecture now everyone what they would do they would feel anyways this guy is doing nothing chalo let's get into barge means you know just enter without permission they would just enter into his cubicle and give him nice long lectures the boy in the makeup department you remember that boy who used to slap makeup on the faces of the actor actresses to make them ugly to look to look presentable i still find that extremely strange so the boy in the makeup department had decided i should be enlightened on how great literary talent was being allowed to go waste in a department fit only for barbers and perverts now you know that office boy which i just mentioned to you he also decided he had decided that i should be enlightened that means the author he should be uh, you know told about he should be aware about how great literary talent was being allowed to go waste you remember that office boy he also wanted to be a he was a poet he used to write poetry so he used to come and tell him that it's such a waste being here i am so talented in a department fit for only barbers and perverts barbers we know hairdressers perverts we know who are sexually abnormal now he said this place is fit for such people what what are we talented people doing here soon i was praying for crowd shooting all the time he used to pray and why would he pray nothing short of it could save me from his epics he says the day there was crowd shooting you remember it was his department to slap makeup on their faces the crowd all over right he used to do that so he the author used to pray that god i hope there is crowd shooting so at least he is busy doing his work and i don't have to look uh, listen to his epics you know those long long poems of ancient india uh, long ago poems and speak of that great adventure then so he saying thank god at least i will get saved if he is occupied i can peacefully do my work subhu was the number 2 at gemini studios he couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our grown up makeup boy had now whom are we talking about you'll get to know very soon that this man was an amazing actor he was an author he was a lyricist as well as a film director based in tamil nadu so he was at number 2 and those days he was leading at number 2 on the contrary that's opposite in nature in fact all the opposite he must have had to face more uncertain and difficult times for when he began his career there were no firmly established film producing companies or studios so when subhu started his journey in the film industry those days there was they were not very well established film producing companies or studios he had to struggle a lot he though he was so talented he was multi talented yet he had a lot of struggle but let me tell you bring your notice this bring this to your notice he couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our grown up makeup boy had if you remember our grown up makeup boy he also wanted to become an actor so there was this thing which was there even in the matter of education especially formal education subhu couldn't have had an appreciable lead over our boy he was not even as educated as our makeup boy yet he became so famous yet he made it so big but by virtue here you can take it as good luck but by virtue of being born a brahman a virtue indeed now this was basically virtue means you know when you have those high praises where you have those nice moral values moral standards you're very high at that but here 
it was his good luck why because he was born in a brahmin family so all the things that were giving him that negative aspect you know everything got coated everything got covered he must have had exposure to more affluent situations and people now because he belonged to the brahmin family at that point of time he was more acquainted he used to meet a lot of wealthy well-known people and come across similar situations that was the reason it added to his luck he had the ability to look cheerful at all times even after having had a hand in a flop film now he was such an encouraging person he did not get demotivated though he had you know had a flop film he was not demotivated by the fact yet he kept going on he did not give up he had a very beautiful smile always he always had work for somebody he could never do things on his own but his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principle completely and turn his entire creativity to his principal's advantage what was it all about he always had work for somebody now very amazing and very shocking though he was not he was not ready to do work on his own he didn't do that what he would do is he would deploy work to people he would always ask somebody to work for him why because his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principle completely he was a very loyal person now that one big good quality that rich quality in him actually made people do things for him and turn his entire creativity to his principles advantage that was the main principle quality he had loyalty and that became as an advantage <clears throat> he was tailor made for films now this man he was totally and totally made for films he was tailor made god had given him all the qualities to be into the film industry here was a man who could be inspired when commanded now this was the man he was a very inspiring person the rat fights the tigress under water and kills her but takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly i don't know how to do the scene the producer would say and subu would come out with four ways of the rat pouring affection on its victim's offspring now here this paragraph is actually you know bringing to you the creativity how he would think out of the box where people would not have a single solution to their problem now there was this producer who wanted to create a scene he wanted to you know shoot that scene in his movie and he did not know how to go about but just imagine that producer did not have a single way and this uh, guy subu his creativity his innovative thinking his thinking out of the box actually gave him many more options how to go about but what he what was the scene the rat fights the tigress under water they have a fight there and kills her he kills the tigress but he takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly he says now he wants to show he did not uh, he killed the tigress but he wanted to make sure that he is showing love for the cubs for the baby of the tigress and tend them lovingly i don't know how to do it he tells him but what did subu do he came out with four ways not even one not even two not even three he had four ways of showing how to how the rat is going to pour affection on the victims offspring victim tigress offspring the cub so how the rat is going to express how he's going to show his love and affection towards those cubs good but i am not sure it is effective enough the producer would say and in a minute subu would come out with 14 more alternatives wow you can imagine his level of creativity you can imagine his level of thinking he the producer would doubt that he says uh, maybe that not might be really very effective the way you are telling me and immediately on the spot subu would give him 14 other ways to do it filmmaking must have been and was so easy with a man like subu around and if ever there was a man who gave direction and definition to gemini studios 
during its golden years, it was Subu. Like we said, he was tailor-made for films, right? We just said that line previously. Now, this is how it was. Filmmaking had actually become easy for everybody. Why? Because they would go and take ideas from Subu. They would ask for his guidance, his direction, his creative thinking, and then they would work accordingly. So that is the reason they say that this was the man who gave direction to the Gemini Studios when it, during its golden years. He was the one responsible for it. Subu had a separate identity as a poet. And though he was certainly capable of more complex and higher forms, he deliberately chose to address his poetry to the masses. Now, apart from being an author, an actor, a film director, Subu was also a very well-known poet. Now, what did he do? He could have gone way higher. If you talk of films, he could have got higher complex. I mean, you know, many more opportunities. But what did he prefer? He deliberately, he forcefully actually chose to address his poetry. He preferred this poetry was so well written. Now, a man who could think so creatively, obviously, could have been one of those best poets. So, he, uh, he wanted to make sure that all the people, the masses, should know his poetry. His success in films overshadowed and dwarfed his literary achievements, or so his critics felt. Now, he was successful in films, we are all aware, but that success was not as big as a success of a poet. The way as a poet he achieved success, now this success of the films overshadowed, it became way more it and dwarfed. In comparison, it was very little, right? So it darkened this achievement and it brightened his achievement as a poet. He, his literary achievements were way more than his film achievements. That is what his critics felt. He composed several truly original story poems in folk refrain and diction and also wrote a sprawling novel, Tilana Mohanambal, with dozens of very deftly etched characters. Wow, this man did a lot. He definitely did a lot. He composed several truly original story poems. He used to write poems. Now, in those poems, there, were, the po there was a story which was woven in the form of a poem. The story used to be written in the form of a poem. In folk refrain, in whichever language he would write, refrain, you know, when the lines are repeated in poetry, he would do that. So, he did that and the diction and also wrote a sprawling novel. Sprawling novel is novel. Thilana Mohanambal was extremely famous. Everyone all around read that novel. This novel spread. It was a widespread novel. Everyone was aware of it. With dozens of very deftly etched characters. He had created so many characters effortlessly. Deftly, deftly means effortlessly. He gave birth to those characters. He defined those characters in that novel. He quite successfully recreated the mood and manner of the Devdasis of the early 20th century. Now here he had also, you know, redone literally, he recreated the mood and the manner. Devdasis here, these are the girls who actually give their life, you know, they serve the deity, right? They give up their life in that, uh, they give it to the deity and they serve the deity all the time. But uh, of course, of late, these things don't exist. It was then. He was an amazing actor. He never aspired to the lead roles, but whatever subsidiary role he played in any of the films, he performed better than the supposed main players. Now, he was so talented, he was so good at it, that even if he got the less important roles, subsidiary roles are, it's not the lead role, it's not the hero, but he played, you know, the side roles also, even in that when he played the roles, he did it way better than the people who were taking the lead roles. He did performed way better than them. 
He had a genuine love for anyone he came across and his house was a permanent residence for dozens of near and far relations and acquaintances. He was a very soft-hearted person. You know, he, he was very, he wanted to make sure that all his people around him were very comfortable. So they all found place in his house and in his heart. It was a permanent residence. Literally dozens of them would be in his house for all his relations, be their relations or be the people whom he knew, his acquaintances. They always were very comfortable. They found all the love and comfort in his house. It seemed against Subhu's nature to be even conscious that he was feeding and supporting so many of them. Though there were so many of them staying in his house, but he never had that thought that I am doing it. He never had it at all. It was happening. He was going with the flow. He never had that ego thing that, oh, I am looking after so many people. All of them are staying in my house was not the fact. Such a charitable and improvident man. And yet he had enemies. Now this is shocking. He was so generous. He was so charitable and improvident. Improvident is that person who spends without any planning. He's, he just uses all his money of doesn't even realize that he's losing all the money. So he, you know, he spends planless. He doesn't plan anything. It's totally unplanned expenditure. But in spite of doing all this, being so good, being so generous, being so humble, he had enemies. Was it because he seemed so close and intimate with the boss? Now, what was the reason behind it? Why did he have enemies in spite of being such a good person, so good at heart? He was very close to whom? The boss. Who is the boss we are referring to? The boss is the founder of Gemini Studios, S.S. Vasan. So he was always with him. You know, when you're very close to the boss, others are obviously very jealous of you. So yes, quite a few times. Or was it his general demeanor? that resembled a sycophant. Now, was that his actual behavior, his general behavior that resembled a sycophant? A sycophant in simple terms, if I tell you, you will understand, you know, maska lagana, maska marna, like we say in, you know, layman's, uh, layman's language. But here, you know, when you give importance to someone who is higher in order at an hierarchy, top level, and you are doing that to gain advantage. So it's just like maska lagana for your own benefit. Or his readiness to say nice things about everything. What was his actual behavior? He was all set to say good about everything at any point of time. In any case, there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direst things for Subu. Now, there was this person in that makeup department, if you remember. He wished the most terrible things for Subhu. He was so ultra jealous of that person that he wished the most terrible, the direst things for Subhu. You saw Subhu always with the boss, S.S. Vasan, founder of Gemini Studios, just reminding you. But in the attendance roles, he was grouped under a department called the story department, comprising a lawyer and an assembly of writers and poets. Now, most of the time, you would find him with the boss. He was always roaming around just behind him. He was always with him. But when it came to the attendance part, now obviously you have to have some check. You know, they have come, not come. So where they had the attendance roles, yes, he was grouped under a particular category. And which was that? It was the department of the uh, story department. It was a department called the story department. Now, who was there in that story department? Who all were there? There was a lawyer. Strange, isn't it? A lawyer in the story department and an assembly of writers and poets. Now, obviously, if it's a story department, you need writers and poets. But you also had a lawyer amongst them. The lawyer was also officially known as the legal advisor, but everybody referred to him as the opposite. Now, obviously, he's a lawyer, so he's a legal advisor. But people spoke opposite. They went against that. Why? You'll just know. 
Now, this so happened and that's the reason, you know, people started referring to him as the opposite. An extremely talented actress who was also extremely temperamental. Now, there was a shoot going on. It's a studio, obviously. So, a very talented act, uh, actress who was extremely temperamental. Temperamental means the mood swing changes within a span of, within a second, you know, you just don't know and her mood changes. So these are those mood swings, like she was extremely uh, extreme at this level. Once blew over on the sets, once she lost her balance, she just started screaming on the set. There was a shoot going on and suddenly she just, you know, starts blasting at the producer. What did he do? While everyone stood stunned, everyone was shocked. What is she doing? What is she speaking? Why is she doing it? They were also shocked. What did the lawyer do? The lawyer quietly switched on the recording equipment. Now, this was not a shoot. It was not a scene happening. But here, within the scene, she created a scene. It was like that. So she suddenly just, you know, went off the beat and she started screaming at the producer. So what did he go, do? Now everyone was shocked what is happening. Nobody, you know, everyone lost balance. Nobody was on that alert mode at that point of time. But yes, the lawyer was. What did he quickly do was he ran and he switched on the recording equipment. When the actress paused for breath, when she screamed and screamed and screamed and finally when she stopped for a second, she took a break. The lawyer said to her, one minute please and played back the recording. You can just imagine the scene, just visualize it. Like, you know, she's screaming and screaming out of her which she just screams and she stops and someone tells her, okay, just a minute. And the same things, what she did, what she said, how she said was coming back to her the same moment. You could imagine her plight. There was nothing incriminating or unmentionably foul about the actress tirade against the producer. Now, actually, the lawyer didn't really mean bad against her. Uh, incriminating, he was not literally accusing her. He was not making her feel guilty about the fact or he wasn't even really, he, he didn't mean anything bad. Unmentionably foul was he didn't really mean anything bad about the actress tirade. Tirade was that speech of criticism that came up from her, that thing that she started accusing the uh, producer. He didn't mean anything really wrong against it. But when she heard her voice again through the sound equipment, she was struck dumb. She was totally for, in for a big shock. Of course, anybody would have in her place. A girl from the countryside, now here they are talking, giving you a little background about this actress. She was a girl from the countryside. She hadn't gone through all the stages of worldly experience that generally precede a position of importance and sophistication that she had found herself catapulted into. Now, this girl, this actress who had screamed so much, she was from the countryside, right? And actually, success had just suddenly come to her. I mean, she didn't really work very hard. She had not gone through the stages of worldly experience. She had not experienced how this actually film line works, how this world works, how she should be actually behaving with everybody. She had not yet got into that process. Which actually, this process comes when you, when you attain that position. When, now generally, you don't attain a position uh, immediately. You know, you go step by step by step. And in every step, you learn. You tend to learn out of your own experience. You tend to learn through others' guidance. But the, the bad luck here was, she hadn't gone through all that. Very suddenly, she had become a very successful actress. So she had, you know, missed all these steps. She had missed all these experiences from which she could have taken lessons. So that was missing at her end. And so these steps which precede a position of importance and sophistication, sophistication as in knowing others' behavior, you know, getting to know how to uh, adapt to other people's behavior, how to actually behave with people or how to react to their behavior. She did not have all that. She found herself catapulted into, she suddenly found herself into that situation. You know, very suddenly she fell into this grave situation. She never quite recovered from the terror she felt that day. 
just imagine just just imagine shut your eyes and just imagine the scene that the whole thing is coming back to you that very moment in front of everybody in front of those same people where she had actually screamed so the that terror that day the terror that was built that embarrassment that was filled in her head that day she never ever recovered she never came out of that embarrassment that was the end of a brief and brilliant acting career it was over there though she was talented though she was so beautiful but still luck did not favor her further she stopped it there the legal adviser who was also a member of the story department you remember that lawyer amongst the assembly of writers and poets so the same person though he was a legal adviser had unwittingly unwittingly as an unknowingly very unknowingly he had brought about that sad end for that beautiful actress very un he actually his intention was not to do that but you know because she suddenly created a scene in front of everybody so he just wanted to tell her you know make her realize probably what are you doing but uh, it it really turned out very wrongly you know it came to a very wrong and end and her career actually came to an end while every other member of the department now moving further to the next next aspect here they are talking about the clothing yeah so let's go for it while every other member of the department wore a kind of uniform khadi dhoti with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white khadi shirt the legal adviser wore pants and a tie and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of mail now everyone was living in the generation in that era of gandhi so what they all did was they all wore khadi dhotis now we all know what are dhotis and khadi is you know that home spun you know the cotton cloth so out of that they wore those dhotis with a slightly oversized you know those long type and very clumsy loose and long uh, kurtas they were tailored kurtas they were everybody wore this but what did the legal adviser wear he wore pants and a tie he wore something formal he wore pants he wore a tie over his shirt and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of mail what do you mean by a coat of mail a coat we all know what is a coat but what do you mean by a coat of mail coat of mail is uh, you know it's it's a jacket with has metal rings on it you know it it's you know generally those types you know where they wear as a shield in the battle to shield their bodies to protect their bodies like an armor does so he it looked like a coat of mail it wasn't obviously but yeah he wore that coat sometimes often he looked alone and helpless a man of cold logic in a crowd of dreamers now he sort of was the black sheep over there black sheep as in he was the odd person there why he was the odd person because he was a man of cold logic his logic did not accustom to the general culture the language the personality he did, it, his logic did not connect with the emotions he did not bother his logic was very cold very blunt you know he just went on the spot he did not bother how people reacted to it or whether it made any difference to them or not irrespective so he was a man of cold logic in a crowd of dreamers dreamers as in here people were dreaming to make it high to make it big but he was just there the odd black sheep a neutral man in an assembly of gandhiites and khadiites he did not bother his dress was different he was the only one who was not dressed like the other people he was everyone was there everyone it was an assembly of gandhiites and khadiites all were wearing khadi all were in the proper you know they were going as per the era of uh, gandhi like so many of those who were close to the boss the boss the founder okay like so many of those like all of them who were so close to the boss he was allowed to produce a film and though a lot of raw stock and pancake were used out on it not much came out of the film now he was very close to the founder of the studios right now because he was very close he was allowed to produce a film he was that close so obviously you have a uh, you know mindset accordingly you have uh, 
a good compatibility with him. So he was allowed, he was permitted. The boss allowed him to produce a film. And of course, uh, he made a film. So there was a lot of uh, uh, pancake, if you remember that makeup used. A lot of raw stock, a lot of makeup was slapped over the faces of the actors and actresses and the crowd. But bad luck unfortunately not much came of the film that film did not really work a lot it did not run a lot now here we come to the end of part one of this story we shall know more about it in the next part now here we are at the second part of the poets and pancakes so far whatever you learned about the gemini studios you learned about subu now we go further with the story then one day, the boss closed down the story department and this was perhaps the only instance in all human history where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home. Let me br bring this back to you. If you remember, the story department had a lawyer amongst the assembly of writers and poets. Now, it so happened that one day the boss, the founder of Gemini Studios, planned to close down the story department. Probably it wasn't running that very well. So, it was at that point of time, it was the first time in history that a lawyer lost his job. What job? Where he was writing his poetry. His, the Gemini Studios was the favorite haunt of poets like SDS Yogya, Sangu Subramaniam, Krishna Shastri and Harindranath Chattopadhyay. Now these people very frequently, favorite haunt means these, these people, these poets were frequent visitors at the Gemini studios. It had an excellent mess. Mess, now this is the place where generally you are served tea, coffee, you, have, you can get all your meals over there. So this studio had the best mess, which supplied good coffee at all times of the day and for most part of the night. Now, when you are working, you know, in, in a studio, you definitely need to have this because you need beverages like tea and coffee to keep you going. You need those small cutting chai, you need those boosters to keep you going. If you want to stay awake, yes, a cup of coffee, we are all aware, keeps you going even at night. So they had it throughout the day and of course most part of the night because they would keep shooting all day and all night. Those were the days when Congress rule meant prohibition and meeting over a cup of coffee was rather satisfying entertainment. Now in those days it was the Congress that was in rule that was you know ruling it was in power and of course they had put on a lot of bans a lot of things forbidden you know don't do this and don't do that and lots of them so these people were terrified they were really i mean you know fed up of all of that so whenever they sat with a friend over a cup of coffee that was real entertainment for them that was really entertaining it would you know just drive away all their frustrations so they enjoyed that Barring the office boys and a couple of clerks, everybody else at the studios radiated leisure, a prerequisite for poetry. Barring as in apart from stopping. You bar somebody, you stop somebody. And who were they? The office boys and a couple of clerks. They were not allowed to be there. You know, everybody else at the studios radiated leisure. Now, these were not there because they were busy. They were occupied. So, apart from them, apart from all these people, there were the others who actually radiated leisure. As in, they enjoyed that leisure time, that free time. Why? Because it was a prerequisite for poetry. You know, when you are writing, you need to be at your best. Your mind needs to be settled. Because if there's a, fr a lot of frustration, you can never get the right juggle of words. Right? You can never write. Because you need a, a peaceful mind. When you want to write something, when you want to pour your emotions onto paper, you need the right you know, ambience. Now, all of them who were, now there were many poetries, those poets over there. So they would use that for getting the best out of them. Most of them wore khadi and worshipped Gandhiji. But beyond that, they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind. 
Yes, they did worship Gandhi, they did wear khadi, they did that, but only till there. They did not go further, right? They had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind. That's where politics stopped for them. They never appreciated politics at all, be it of any kind. They did not. They were okay only till there. They would follow the rules. Naturally, they were all averse to the term communism. Very obviously, they disliked. Averse means they had a hatred. They disliked the term communism. Communism, we are all aware, when everything is in the hands of the government, when the government rules, right? That's where they bring equality in the society, under one rule. Now, why did they you know, really dislike communism. A communist was a godless man. That word says it all. Godless man. He did not, he was not at all scared of God. He had nothing called as a conscious, as a guilt conscious. He had nothing. He was totally a God fearless man. He did not fear at all. What would he do? What, what tells you this? He had no filial or conjugal love. Filial is when you have the bond with your children, son or daughter. And conjugal is when you're in that marriage bond. So basically your spouse. He had no feelings. He had zero feelings for, their, for his own very family. He had no compunction about killing his own parents or his children. Can you just imagine this man? Can you imagine his mindset? What it must be? No children, no spouse, even not his parents. There was no compunction. He would not be reluctant about it. He would just go ahead and shoot them and kill them, be it his parents or be it his children. He was always out to cause and spread unrest and violence among innocent and ignorant people. Obviously, he never wanted the peace thing going around. He would go and create a lot of violence and a lot of unrest among people who knew, who hardly knew anything. They didn't know much and he was the one to go and, you know, uh, instigate all the nonsense. Such notions which prevailed everywhere else in South India at that time also naturally floated about vaguely among the khadi clad poets of Gemini Studios. Now, such type of notions, when they had this in their head, when he went on, you know, spreading it, it prevailed everywhere else. In South India, these things were spreading, you know, such type of notions. Uh, India, uh, South India at that time, and naturally, it floated about vaguely. Vaguely as in uncertainly, it was not a certain thing, very uncertainly it went on spreading among the khadi clad poets of Germany. These things reached the poets as well. Evidence of it was soon forthcoming. Now how this happened and what happened after that, it was sort of just nearing, it was just about to come. When Frank Bookman Moral Rearmament Army. When Frank Bookman's Moral Rearmament Army, some 200 strong visited Madras sometime in 1952. They could not have found a warmer host in India than the Germany Studios. Now let me tell you something about Frank Bookman's Moral Rearmament Army. It was actually uh, an international uh, movement you know it it was all about spirituality and uh, a lot of moral things in it so this movement where the spiritual movement came now when this happened and this was uh, the american uh, minister you had this frank bookman who actually uh, led it it was the oxford group who actually started this now this movement reached india now when this movement reached india there in 1952, they had to find a place. Now around 200 strong, 200 of them had come. Now where would they put up? In India, right? So it was nowhere else but the loving and welcoming Germany Studios. Someone called the group an international circus. Now they were coming around to spread the word of peace. So. They were also called like an international circus. And why was that? They weren't very good on the trapeze and their acquaintance with animals was only at the dinner table. But they presented 
two plays in the most professional manner. Now, here they call them sort of an international circus because they did perform, you know, those acts on trapeze. You remember the trapeze, the acrobats they do in the air. You've, or we've all seen a circus thing. So they were not good at it. But you know what? Uh, the importance of animals for them. They were not actually good with the animals. But you know how he has put it very beautifully. It was only at the dinner table. What do you mean by and what, what what connection of animals and the dinner table? You're right, they were non-vegetarians. So in fact, that was the importance of animals for them. But yes, uh, apart from not being good acrobats, they were not good on the trapeze. They did present two plays in the most professional manner. Now these two plays which they came up with uh, actually spread like fire. You know, the, the words, the message out of that uh, really affected a lot many people. Their Jotham Valley and The Forgotten Factor, these were the two main plays which actually ran several shows in Madras and along with the other citizens of the city. The Gemini family of 600, let me get you again, the Gemini family of 600 saw the plays over and over again. Now these two plays, Jotham Valley and The Forgotten Factor, it was definitely there uh, in Madras. It ran, uh, ran a lot many times along with the citizens of uh, the city but also along with the citizens of the city, the Gemini family of 600 also enjoyed this play and kept watching it over and over again. The message of the plays were usually plain and simple homilies. Now, what was the message given of the uh, given by these plays? They were very simple. They were very, uh, you know, put up very nicely so that these people could all actually understand those. Uh, actually, the spiritual messages, you know, you get out of it. But the sets and costumes were first rate. Yes, they were very simple. They were the messages were very simple, but the set that they put up, the ambience of the play was superb. Madras and Tamil drama community were terribly impressed for some years almost all Tamil plays had a scene of sunrise and sunset in the manner of Jotham Valley with a bare stage, a white background curtain and a tune played on the flute. Now, what was this? This play that they had put up, Jotham Valley, it was so impressionable. It laid such a good impression that all of the people, the Tamil drama community, right? They were so impressed that all of them, when they started putting up their plays, they somehow copied, they imitated these people a bit. They had the sunrise and the sunset seen in their dramas, just like they had a bare stage, an empty stage, a white background curtain, right? Every The stage was empty, the background had a white curtain and there was a very melodious tune played on the flute. It was played by the flute. It was some years later that I learned that the MRA, Moral Rearmament Army, was a kind of counter movement to international communism and the big bosses of Madras, like Mr. Vasan, simply played into their hands. Now, it so happened that they got to know actually what this Moral Rearmament Army was up to. They were actually against communism. They were totally not in favor of communism, which prevailed at that point of time. So they were playing anti it, right? And the people like Mr. Vasan, they, these innocent people actually were suffering because of this. Played into their hands as in, he was ready to do anything that benefited them, though he himself was in for a big loss. So, this is how they were doing. They were acting in such a manner that actually Mr. Vasan was helping them out. He actually let them put up in his own studios. But these people were totally anti-communism and the losses were being incurred by Mr. Vasan. I am not sure, however, that this was indeed the case for the unchangeable aspects of these big bosses and their enterprises remained the same MRA or no MRA, international communism or no international communism. He says, I, I just kept wondering that was this the case? Was it because of this? 
or was it that these people were never ready to change it was the unchangeable aspects the bosses like mr wasan they were not ready to accept any kind of change they wanted to be the way as they are right and due to which their enterprises also remained the same there was no change in those enterprises at all be it whatever factor whether the mra existed or not or international communism existed existed or not they were all the same the staff of gemini studios had a nice time hosting 200 people of all hues and sizes of at least 20 nationalities now you remember there were 200 people out of them who had who were staying at the gemini studios and the people the staff of the gemini studios very lovingly made them comfortable and took care of them the people were all of different hues as in all different complexions now you all know with they were from different nationalities so obviously the complexions and the body structures and culture everything was different but yet they made them all comfortable it was such a change from the usual collection of crowd players waiting to be slapped with thick layers of makeup by the office boy in the makeup department now the whole thing had changed the whole scenario in the studios had changed now here they were not you know slapping makeup on the crowd right the makeup department was not into all of this in fact they were doing the hospitality role they were actually making these people comfortable so there was a i mean there was a big change in their role what they were what they would usually do and what they were currently doing with so many people in their studios a few months later the telephone lines of the big bosses of madras buzzed and once again we at gemini studios cleared a whole shooting stage to welcome another visitor now frank bookman and his people left over and out that was done now a few years uh, sorry a few months later now there was another call there it was time for gemini studios to host another visitor and who was he they cleared all their shooting stage to make again place again make the room comfortable the studio comfortable for someone else all they said was that he was a poet from england now they were not aware who actually were they expecting they only knew that okay he is a poet from england now the only poets from england the simple gemini staff knew or heard of were wordsworth and tennyson the more literate ones knew of keats shelley and byron and one or two might have faintly come to know of someone by the name of eliot who was the poet visiting the gemini studios now now the most common uh, you know ones the poets which these people were aware of were wordsworth tennyson or even a little more if they knew deeper it was keats shelley and byron and still if you someone who was very well versed with the poets he also knew eliot but they kept wondering which amongst all these is going to pay a visit which poet is going to come here he is not a poet he is an editor that's why the boss is giving him a big reception he said he's not a poet but he is an editor and that's why mr wasan made sure that he welcomes him very beautifully he gave him a grand reception wasan was also the editor of the popular tamil weekly ananda vikatan now mr ss wasan himself the founder of the gemini studios was also the editor of what of ananda vikatan it was a tamil weekly <coughs> He wasn't the editor of any of the known names of British publications in Madras that is those known at the Gemini Studios now the editors these people at the Gemini Studios were aware of this editor who was coming wasn't one of them they were sure of that since the top men of the hindu were taking the initiative the surmise was that the poet was the editor of a daily but not from the manchester guardian or the london times now it was a big guess you know it was a big guess work going on that who is the actual visitor they kept guessing it though they were you know 
pretty prominent it was that he was someone big someone nice but they had no proof they had no proper grip to get the name and so they kept thinking that you know uh, the top men of the hindu were take they were trying to take that initiative that okay these are the people but what proof that's him only it's coming who is it actually he is definitely not uh, you know the editor of a daily that is the manchester guardian or the london times they were aware of the editors of these people so they said it's not even him that was all that even the most well informed among us knew generally when someone who you know um, the people who are very close to the boss they get to know all the inside information but somewhere even the well informed this time only knew that he is an editor and knew nothing more than that so they it was like a sort of a suspense for them at last came the day came the time at last around 4 in the afternoon the poet or the editor arrived now finally came that grand moment that time where the suspense was to be broken and everyone would finally come to know who is he he was a tall man very english very serious and of course very unknown to all of us so when he arrived they describe him as he was very tall he was very english he had that very you know uh, english look on himself very serious he was not the you know hale and hearty types and obviously none of us knew him he was very unknown to all of us battling with half a dozen pedestal fans on the shooting stage the boss read out a long speech now obviously everyone gathered over there to see who was he everyone was curious to know they were eager to know that who was he and finally when he came they were all looking you know they all gathered out there so fighting amongst all of them as in you know just going through all of them uh, the boss finally read out a long speech he had kept all of us in suspense none of us knew actually anything about this person anything about this visitor so finally now the boss gives a nice long speech to unveil to disclose everything it was obvious that he too knew precious little about the poet or the editor even he himself the boss himself was not really well equipped with the information he did not have much of the information he knew precious little he knew just the main main things he did not know much about this man the speech was all in the most general terms but here and there it was peppered with words like freedom and democracy now he spoke in general now obviously you know when you want to talk about somebody you have his profile you read out you know you know all the details but here the boss knew nothing not much it's not nothing but he knew very little so what he did was he spoke in general he welcomed him in general not specifying anything obviously if you don't know what can you talk so he spoke in general and he peppered with words like peppered with words as in a few words here and there he added in his speech like freedom and democracy so now somewhere they were sort of getting a little guideline now finally the visitor was invited on the stage to speak then the poet spoke he couldn't have addressed a more dazed and silent audience no one knew what he was talking about and his accent defeated any attempt to understand what he was saying now he was english obviously his accent was very different uh it so happens we all watch english movies but you know most of us i think depend on the subtitles right but once you start listening it's a good thing you know to watch those movies without the subtitles you gradually start understanding their tone their accent so here what happened was he addressed the most silent crowd people were shocked people were you know in a daze they were totally shocked they had no idea what was you know what was coming up next so they were very silent to listen to him and when he started speaking the problem was his accent defeated any attempt 
to understand what he was saying. We all tried to understand, but we all failed. We could not understand because of his English accent. The whole thing lasted about an hour. Then the poet left and we all dispersed in utter bafflement. What are we doing? Now this whole thing, the whole scene went on. He spoke, the boss spoke, the poet spoke. They, this all went on for an hour. People did not understand anything. They were left with uh, total, you know, they were empty. They did not get anything out of this because obviously they could not understand what the man spoke. So everyone dispersed. We all left in utter bafflement. What are we doing? They had no understanding. There was no outcome of the whole thing. So they were blank. They were totally blank that what are we doing? What is an English poet doing in a film studio which makes Tamil films for the simplest sort of people? They were, they were unable to understand, they were unable to comprehend, they were unable to register that what is this man, what is he doing in a studio where there are Tamil films which are made for the simple sort of people? People, in a way, you, people who can understand everything. What is this hi-fi man doing here? People whose lives least afforded them the possibility of cultivating a taste for English poetry. They were like, the Tamil films were not easily acceptable. They were not easily, you know, afforded by the people. What would they do with an English poetry? Was it even going to happen? Was it possible to happen? The possible of cultivating a taste? The poet looked pretty baffled too. He was equally confused with what is going on there. For he too must have felt the sheer incongruity of his talk about the thrills and travels of an English poet. Now, why was he confused? Even he was equally confused looking at the reaction. Obviously, when the audience was not ready to understand, not ready to understand as in they were not able to understand because of his British accent. So even he felt the same. He could not, you know, when you are talking and uh, the audience is reacting, you know, you feel good, right? You feel, okay, your things are being understood. They are being accepted. But that was not the case here. So he felt that there was no harmony. There was no compatibility between what he was talking and the audience. It was not getting to them. It was not happening. When he spoke about the thrills and the works of an English poet, they could not understand anything. His visit remained an unexplained mystery. What was that English poet doing in a studio where there were Tamil films? The people had taste only of that. They he was there. Was he there to cultivate the taste of English poetry over there, which was a huge task? The great prose writers of the world may not admit it, but my conviction, my belief grows stronger day after day that prose writing is not and cannot be the true pursuit of a genius. He says, now Ashoka Mitran is talking about, look, I know after what I am experiencing every day, I can simply tell you that prose writing, the people who write is not the pursuit, is not the hobby of a genius. You don't have to be intelligent for it. To be a writer, to be a poet, it requires different, can I say additional qualities, right? You cannot just write. You, it's not that if you are intelligent, you can be an author, you can be a poet. No, this is what he's trying to tell us that I have a strong belief now that this poet, uh, poetry writing or being an author is not the work only of intelligent people. It is for the patient, persistent, persevering drudge with a heart so shrunken that nothing can break it. What is it for? For whom it is? What qualities do you require to become an author? You definitely need to have all the patience on earth. You will write. You will not write, like the line. You will rewrite. You might still not like that line. You will still rewrite. So it is a continuous persistent effort. You have to have patience. You have to continue doing it no matter what 
persevering drudge no matter it is for those people who really can work hard they will not give up with a heart so shrunken that nothing can break it they will not stop even if they fail they will keep trying and trying and they will write rejection slips don't mean a thing to him no matter if your poetry has not been accepted people have rejected it but that will not stop you you have to keep going he at once sets about making a fresh copy of the long prose piece and sends it to another editor enclosing postage for the return of the manuscript he even if he gets a rejection slip immediately he will not give up he will not be disheartened he will at once what will he do he will make a fresh copy he will write something else of the long prose piece he might make another copy of the same and he will send it to another editor maybe editor a rejected but he will not stop there he will not give up there he will not be disheartened he will go to editor b with a fresh piece of his prose and what will he enclose in that a postage for the return of the manuscript he would even enclose that he should you know the editor should actually read his script and then he should return it back to him so he uh, you know as the postage to it for the manuscript the piece that he has written obviously which has not yet been published so that's a manuscript it is written or maybe handwritten or typed by the author and it has not yet been published now it was for such people it was for such people that the hindu had published a tiny announcement in an insignificant corner of an unimportant page a short story contest organized by a british periodical by the name the encounter well what are they telling you now it was for such people which people these people who inherited all these qualities what had the hindu done the hindu had published a small announcement now this announcement was where it was in an insignificant corner of an unimportant page it was just there for the heck of it for the sake of it they had published that story uh, writing competition a short story contest organized by a british periodical a, Br a british periodical maybe a type of a newspaper or magazine that keeps coming at regular intervals it is published by the name the encounter so this british periodical was with the name the encounter these people had arranged a story writing competition of course the encounter wasn't a known commodity among the gemini literati now what do you mean by that the encounter the the british periodical if you remember uh, it wasn't very well known where it came to the gemini literati the well educated people who were interested in literature all those who were there at the gemini somehow this uh, periodical was not very familiar to them i wanted to get an idea of the periodical before i spent a considerable sum in postage sending a manuscript to england he says now i had to send my manuscript to england all the way but i wanted to confirm i wanted to get an idea of this periodical how valid how good how famous is it and i wanted to know about it before i spent so much money where i have to even enclose the postage like done before sending the manuscript to england in those days the british council library had an entrance with no long winded signboards and notices to make you feel you were sneaking into a forbidden area now in those days it was not very uh, you know it was a very informal thing where you could enter the british council library it had an entrance with no long winded uh, signboards there were no big signboards telling you uh, you know step here or don't go there and there were no notices to make you feel that you know as though you are sneaking and as though you are going in for some uh, you know hidingly going and you're sneaking in uh, into an area which you're not supposed to go so it was nothing of the sort it was a very casual usual thing you could just enter the library and there were copies of the encounter lying about in various degrees of freshness almost untouched by readers now like he wanted to find out about the british periodical so what did he do 
he went to the British Council Library and he went to find the encounter, that periodical. And he saw them lying about in various degrees of freshness. Now, they kept coming in, right? So, the older ones were looking very dull. Maybe the new ones were more fresh. But they were almost untouched. Hardly any reader would take those periodicals. When I read the editor's name, I heard a bell ringing in my shrunken heart. Now, he was not aware who was the editor of the encounter. So when he picked up the book and he read the name, he had a bell ringing in his shrunken heart, meaning he was, there was some sort of hope some familiarity, he somewhere felt that, oh, I know this person, you know, some sort of bonding, some sort of connectivity came to his heart, to his shrunken heart, as in he was, where he was all doubtful, he was not sure. So somewhere that hope arose in him. It was the poet who had visited the Gemini Studios. I felt like I had found a long lost brother and I sang as I sealed the envelope and wrote out his address. He felt that, you know, when you know someone and you come across his work after some long many years, he, he was the same person. So he had come to Gemini Studios, if you remember, that uh, English poet who had come, it was the same person. And that's the reason he says, I found a long lost brother. Now he had got very familiar with him, right, when he had come to the studios. So he felt that he's got, you know, connected to someone whom he had lost, whom he knew very well and whom he had lost. I sang as I sealed the envelope and wrote out his address. He was all confident now that yes, I am participating in that story uh, writing competition. And he was very happy when he addressed the envelope to his manuscript he put up there and he was sending it to England. I felt that he too would be singing the same song at the same time. Long lost brothers of Indian films discover each other by singing the same song in the first reel and in the final reel of the film. Now, he was so happy. He was like, he said, this is, he's no longer a stranger to me. He's someone whom I had spent so long, I mean, a lot of time with him at the Gemini Studios. So he felt very good. He felt very comfortable. He became extremely confident while, you know, enclosing his uh, manuscript and, you know, posting it to uh, this guy, uh, Stephen Spender. And he says, these are the long lost brothers of the Indian films discover each other. You finally get connected to each other by and they by, do that by singing the same song in the first reel and in the final reel of the film. So he had met him the first time they were together and now again the final reel of the film. Now again after years they have connected together, you know, probably to close that acquaintance to, I mean, bring it together back again. Stephen Spender. That was his name. And years later, when I was out of Germany studios and I had much time but not much money, anything at a reduced price attracted my attention. Now, years later when he left Gemini Studios, Ashoka Mitran, he said, I did not have a lot of money. I had spent a lot of years, but I did not have a lot of money on me. So whatever I looked for was at a discounted price. I made sure that I don't buy something very expensive. I was attracted, uh, you know, to something which is at a reduced price. I wouldn't mind buying that. On the footpath, in front of the Madras Mount Road post office, something attracted him. There was a book out there. It was at the cost of, I think, 50 paise. So that attracted him. There was something there on the footpath. And he says, I, you know, wouldn't mind going for it. There was a pile of brand new books for 50 paise each. Actually, they were copies of the same book, an elegant paperback of American origin special low price student edition in connection with the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. I paid 50 paise and picked up a copy of the book, The God That Failed. 
Now, he found these, you know, new books there and he was getting it at a mere 50 paise. Right now, it seems mere to us, but in those days, it meant a lot, right? So, he took that and it had an elegant paperback of American origin. You can see that. Now, it was at a very special low price uh, for the reason it was a student edition, obviously. It was in connection with the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. So, he was getting it at a very discounted rate. So he paid 50 paise and he picked up the copy. Which copy was that? What was the name of that? The God That Failed. Six eminent men of letters in six separate essays described their journeys into communism and their disillusioned return. Now the book, The God That Failed had what? What, what, what did it consist of? What did it comprise of? It's a, it comprises of six separate essays uh, by the six eminent uh, people, the six eminent men who had written about their journey of communism, right? And their disillusioned return, something where they were disappointed, they got back. So this is basically talking about communism. Now, who were those six people, the six great men? Andre Gide, Richard Wright, Ignacio Ceylon, Arthur Kostler, Louis Fisher, and Stephen Spender. Stephen Spender? Suddenly, the book assumed tremendous significance. Oh my God, he's the same person. It's him. I am definitely taking that book. Although he had taken it, not knowing that it was he was a part of it. Stephen Spender, the poet who had visited Gemini Studios, in a moment I felt a dark chamber of my mind lit up by a hazy illumination. Now, where he was blank about the book, he didn't really know anything about it, so it is the dark chamber of my mind and a hazy illumination. Suddenly there was a small light, you know, glowing up there, some good thing that came to my mind. The reaction to Stephen Spender at Gemini Studios was no longer a mystery. Now, if you remember when he had visited the Gemini Studios, his visit was a mystery, right? Nobody was aware what is that English poet doing over there in Gemini Studios. But now, after getting to know about him, after seeing his book, he says, now I understand and now I realize that his visit over here at Gemini Studios is no longer a mystery. Solved by now. The boss of the Gemini Studios may not have much to do with Spender's poetry. He says the boss wasn't really, uh, it was not about the poetry that he wrote. Yes, it, the boss was not even interested in that, but not with his God that failed. He was not interested in his poetry, but yes, very much interested about his book, The God That Failed. And so there came the clear picture. The, the doubts were all over. The mystery was solved. And finally, Ashoka Mitran gets to know it all. So yes, students, this is the end of your chapter. A little long, undoubtedly, but pretty interesting. So if you have heard every line, if you have known the meaning of every word, of course, you do have the meanings here. You can definitely, you know, go through them as you are reading. Make sure, kindly make sure that you have read through every line. See, right now you have understood the entire story. But yes, until and unless you get to read it, it makes it much more clearer. Right? So yes, you can definitely go through these meanings. It's very well written out here. And with the same wish, I conclude this session, this video. Keep the reel of life going on without buffering. Make sure we all have a smooth journey ahead. Keep watching. Keep learning.